This is the second day of the Zora Neale Hurston Festival Academic Conference on Afrofuturism, Afrofuturism in the Visual Realm. Um, if you were here with us yesterday, you saw a number of great discussions and explorations of visual culture around Afrofuturism. Today, we want to continue that, but I want to reiterate the question of vision as one that is not just simply the simple question of aesthetics, but really the visions that we use to order society, understand its structure. As we think about the goal of the conference this year, the idea that we are exploring multiple visions rooted in Black experience and Black speculative practice is paramount to our approach. Today, we'll have a number of scholars who will help us see the remnants and impacts of thinking about Blackness and thinking about uh, different visions that are transformative, liberatory, and I think really central to some of the questions that we're facing today. So I know that by this time you're really sick of hearing from me. So it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce um, my colleague on the academic committee, Trent Tremingo. He'll be handling uh, Q&A and introductions for today. But I wanna again, thank everyone who made the journey either virtually or personally here at the US, UCF downtown. Uh, again, thank UCF downtown, uh, UCF um, Dean Brody, uh, Scott French, who's director of public history and a member and a chair of the Academic Council, uh, Associates to Preserve Inville Community for their support for this Afrofuturism cycle. This is a very important set of conversations that we've consistently been engaged with for three years and will continue to the end of 2024. Just a reminder, of course, it is part of this five-year cycle. Site is this year, next year is spirit, and the last year will be space. And then, of course, every one of those will be these sort of multi-level investigations. So I'm gonna turn over to Trent so we can introduce our first speaker for today. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I met Alex, um, I think it was last year, when uh, Seminole State um, had him and a few others out to speak to us about certain aspects of Afrofuturism. Uh, and I remember the talk being extremely dynamic and people were um, still asking questions uh, later. Uh, so uh, it is my pleasure to introduce him to, you know, to, the, to the Zora Festival. Uh, I'm going to read from the bio because, as I told Julian, you know, you know, I, I I I don't know these people as well as he, so I can't speak extemporaneously. Uh, so I'll have to read from the bios, but I will let you know that uh, whatever he's going to present today, uh, you will enjoy it. Uh, so Alex uh, Zamlin is associate professor of political science and director of African American studies program at the University of Detroit. Mercy. He is the author of five books, including Black Utopia, the history of an idea from Black nationalism to Afrofuturism, uh, which was named a 2020 choice outstanding title by the American Library Association. His newest book with Beacon Press is titled All is Not Lost, 20 Ways to Revolutionize Disaster and is scheduled for publication in spring of 22. So Zora Festo, I give to you, Alex Zellman. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, um, Trent. Thank you, Julian, for this wonderful invitation. Thank you, Scott, for helping to organize this. And thank you, all of you, for coming out this morning and being part of these really important conversations. So I'd like to share some of my reflections on Black Utopia and Afrofuturism and get us to think about the social and political implications of Black speculative practice and the way they can help transform our understanding of core concepts in political life. Okay. Is uh, make sure everything is uh, 
So the title of my talk today is Afrofuturism and Black Utopia. And I think before we get started, it's important to understand the contours of what we mean by both Afrofuturism and Black Utopia. So as you see here, Mark Derry tries to define Afrofuturism through a very particular understanding related to technology, technoculture, and as he puts it, a kind of science fiction future. But through my work studying Black literary production, Black cultural production, what I uncover is that Black utopia is irreducible to a notion of Afrofuturism that is connected only to science fiction. For me, looking at the core and seminal texts of Black utopian thought and practice, it's clear that Black utopia asks us to rethink core contexts, core conversations, core structures of what it means to be human, what it means to live in a society dominated by injustice, but also what it means to reconceptualize society in an emancipatory way. So as I say, if Black utopia has in fact been an expression of what the political scientist Richard Eiten calls the Black fantastic, it's been a fantastical meditation on untapped possibilities already embedded within society, unconditional freedom, equality, interracial intimacy, solidarity, social democracy. With this framework, with an understanding of the way in which Black utopia and Afrofuturism are linked together, melded, conceptualized, one of the things that I try to do in my work is talk about the way that Afrofuturism is something of a utopian method. What does this mean? It means that a utopian method is a paradigm, a space, a frame, a conceptual ideal through which we can begin to engage in a radical practice, expand the boundaries of our imagination. And I think more importantly, critique deficiencies that exist in the present. So when I think of what Afrofuturism is and it's linked to Black utopia, I think of it as a method for both diagnosing what's problematic, missing from contemporary visions of liberatory practice, but also as a way forward as a concept that allows us to think more broadly about society as it could be. So when we think about concepts like defunding the police, like prison abolition, like social justice, like gender equality, like utopian ideas that black thinkers have been promulgating for the past 30 or 40 years, when we imagine Afrofuturism and Black utopia, we're talking about a method that is not only advocating a set of policies or alternatives to our existing political configurations, but we're also talking about a new conceptual vision for how to organize the world, how to think about freedom, how to think about justice, how to think about democracy broadly. The way that I conceptualize Black Utopia is through an engagement with the core text in the Black Utopian tradition. So in my book, Black Utopia, I argue that Black Utopian thought has a set of defining characteristics. And one of the things that I think is important is when we imagine Black speculative practice and specifically the notion of utopia, it's important to put it into conversation with extant modes of utopian theorizing. Many of you are probably familiar with one of the great works in the Euromodern tradition, Thomas More's Utopia. In this particular piece, More is interested in 
trying to put forth an idyllic society. But Moore's society is very much bound by a certain vision of enlightenment progress. It is bound by a certain conception of humanity that both excludes citizens of color, but also is limited in how it imagines the contours of freedom, equality, justice, and possibility. So one of the things that I notice looking at the long tradition of Black utopian theorizing, beginning with a book by Martin Delaney called Blake or the Huts of America, published in 1859, is that from the outset, Black utopian thought is critical of romantic notions of progress that exist in the Euro modern tradition. So if you look at Blake, which is one of the first Afrofuturist Black utopian narratives, which centers on the figure of Henry Blake, uh, an ex slave who tries to engage in a global revolution that unites citizens of color from Cuba, from the Deep South. One of the remarkable things about the narrative is how perceptive Delaney is to the ideas of power. Delaney is incredibly aware of the fragility of utopian practice. He's aware of the way in which coalitions are born, but they dissipate. Visions of freedom exist briefly. There are moments throughout the text where it seems as if Blake, Henry Blake, is very close to achieving a kind of romantic resolution, whether with his wife, who he tries to help um, uh, escape from bondage, or with various political figures that he meets throughout the novel. But it's clear that Delaney wants us to be attentive to the ways in which, if we think about utopia and we think about possibility, we also need to understand limitation within that sense of possibility. So a text like Delaney's Blake, or if you look to the left, you see Sun Ra, the great experimental jazz musician who worked in the 1960s and 1970s. Sun Ra, on the one hand, in his speculative practice, wanted to abolish nuclear war at an age when it seemed like an ever-present threat. There was a moment when he organized or imagined that he would organize a concert, a cosmic concert of 100,000 musicians whose sounds together could blend to create peace and to end the possibility of nuclear war between the United States and Soviet Russia. Sun Ra himself, despite having this sense of radical hope, still understood both in his narratives and in his fashioning of himself, discussing his connection, his spiritual connection to Egypt, to Africa. He understood quite well the ways in which domination, whether through racial enslavement, the Middle Passage, or unfulfilled promises during his own time, during the civil rights era, would always frustrate the possibility of having a kind of romantic and naive sense of hope. So one of the things that I try to identify in the book is whether we begin with Martin Delaney in the 1850s or conclude at the end of the 20th century with Octavia Butler, the great black feminist science fiction writer, there is a distinct tradition of black utopian theorizing that pushes against Euro modern conceptions that stress romantic modes of progress. And in doing this, I emphasize the way Black Utopia is part of an Afro-modern tradition, whether we look at W.B. Du Bois, Angela Davis, Frederick Douglass, all of these thinkers are struggling with the context and meanings of liberation in a world that is defined by notions of progress, by equality, even if these ideas are constantly being unfulfilled, 
being treated as hypocritical by those who enact them, the white majority. In addition to that, I argue throughout the book that Black utopian thought gives us a frame for democratic engagement. And what does this mean? When we think about democracy, we understand the way that it connotes popular rule, popular sovereignty. But one of the impressive things about Black utopian thought is that it gives us a window to think about democracy, not only in terms of institutions, voting rights, uh, the rule of law. It gives us a framework, a sensibility for what it means to engage in democracy in the everyday. What are the notions of conversation, engagement, solidarity, speech that organize a democratic people and allow for solidarity to exist? And this is one of the things that we will discuss um, in the next um, few minutes. So in highlighting the way that Black utopian thought is distinct, politically generative, offers a unique theoretical vantage point. One of the arguments that I make in the book is that art is a source of social and political reflection. Now, this may not seem controversial to many of you, but one of the things that I try to do throughout the book is get us to see the way that fictive representations of life, whether, for instance, it's Sutney Griggs' uh, Imperium in Imperium, or Samuel or Samuel Delaney's Triton science fiction work, 1976. These works of culture, which are works of the imagination, they're not political treatises, they're not manifestos, they're not explicitly connected to matters of the state, statecraft, government, nonetheless offer a powerful source of theoretical reflection. So one of the things that I try to suggest is that we can read art politically. We can read art with a message for what it reveals, not simply in terms of looking at the artist's political leanings or motivations, but seeing the specific contours, the character development, the stories as a window into different possibilities of organizing, of engaging, of speaking, of communicating, all the core characteristics that animate the possibility of democratic life and uh, a liberatory politics. So when I think about, for instance, Imperium and Imperium, which is Sutney Griggs' classic book, which imagines a kind of fictionalized account of an underground revolutionary black movement that tries to overthrow the state of Texas. And the story, Griggs's story in 1899, really tries to look at the competing perspectives on black politics and black liberation. On the one hand, there's a figure who represents the idea of integration, assimilation, nonviolence. On the other is a figure who represents the idea of something much more militant, confrontational, direct. The book is less a commentary on whether this revolutionary movement would be successful or could be successful, but instead it gives us insight into different possibilities of utopian organizing and imagining. It gives us room as citizens to think about how we might agree, push back against, think with the various ideologies that Griggs puts forth to get us to think about the possibility of utopia. So the great advantage of a text like Imperium is that it gives us a framework for, through which we can begin to theorize, examine our own sense of political commitment, but also the potential limitations and possibilities of what it would mean for that commitment to be real. At the same time, you look at a text like Samuel Delaney's Triton, it's 1976. Whereas Griggs in 1899 is very much 
trying to put in a utopian sphere, a conversation that is already happening in black culture, whether through Douglas versus Booker T. Washington, Booker T. Washington against Du Bois, so on. Samuel Delaney's Triton, which is a science fiction fantasy, is on some level concerned with a radical future that is hard to imagine in the 1970s. It's a story in which there is boundless freedom. There is a level of cooperative housing unseen in the United States or globally. There is a commitment to gender fluidity that is unseen in the 1960s and 1970s. Even to a lesser extent, there is a certain degree of racial fluidity Delaney tries to work through the meaning of post-racialism when in Triton, it's possible to not only engage in kind of gender redefinition, but also racial redefinition. The question that preoccupies Delaney in Triton is what would it mean if all of our freedom dreams were realized? So whereas Griggs tries to give us a framework for thinking through various spaces of revolutionary possibility, various modes of engagement, Delaney tries to examine what it would mean to live in a society where the revolutionary promise of post-racialism or of gender fluidity could be within reach. And again, just like Griggs, just like Delaney, Martin Delaney, Samuel Delaney is critical of a romantic notion of utopian possibility. So in the text, the white character, Bron Hellstrom, decides to undergo a um, sex reassignment surgery and decides to transition to identify as a white woman. But what's clear about Delaney's narrative is that in these moments of potential freedom, or ostensible freedom, there are still hierarchies that are not worked through. So Bron Hellstrom, the character, he's a, a white man who transitions to a white woman, ultimately maintains their sexism, maintains their racism. And what Delaney is asking is even in a society that recognizes or achieves some idea of utopian possibility, what good is that utopia? if it does not account for a truly liberatory vision, if sexism, racism are still maintained in that society. So that is an essential and core condition of Black utopian theorizing. On the one hand, sketching out a sense of possibility. On the other hand, frustrating our expectations that that sense of possibility and revolutionary change would actually necessitate a movement toward greater freedom. What I'd like to do is talk about a specific example of what I'm getting at. And a really good way to illustrate this is through the work of W.B. Du Bois. For those of you who are familiar with W.B. Du Bois, he's the great Black sociologist of the 20th century, in many ways one of the great public intellectuals of the 20th century. What's not as well known about Du Bois is that he's also a writer of fiction, and speculative fiction to be precise. One of the chapters in my book is dedicated to an account of two works by Du Bois. One is called Dark Princess, 1928. The other is a short story called The Comet. In this short story, which is an apocalyptic, a post-apocalyptic story, Du Bois imagines what would happen if the two lone survivors after a comet destroys New York are a black man and a white woman. What would their relationship look like? What possibilities would exist in this space. So Du Bois, in a matter of 15 pages, manages to get us to glimpse 
a sense of utopian possibility, while at the same time frustrate that utopian possibility. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to kind of stress throughout the book. So if you look at this language, what Du Bois is trying to suggest here, Du Bois is trying to say that in specific moments, in specific moments where there's a crisis, a disaster, when existing frames of reference collapse, there's a possibility for something new, something fresh. So he discusses the way that these two characters, Jim and Julia, engage one another, how they try to create a community when none exists. And what Du Bois constantly tries to stress is that there's a certain kind of forgetting. It's a productive kind of forgetting. It's a forgetting briefly of class, of racial hierarchy, of racism. But the question is, how revolutionary can this forgetting be? And one of the things that Du Bois tries to emphasize and stress, as I put it, is that failure of recognition is, emancip is emancipatory. Gone is the certainty of affixing definitive value to skin color when Julia first forgets race. She doesn't see Jim as black. And then after she remembers it, doubts the moral weight she places on it. Du Bois dismantles knowledge based in utopian scientific rationality. Everything could be measured, known, tested, fully understood. Value comes from sensitivity to human expressiveness, different gestures, tones of voice, textures of speech that provide cues for responding and engaging with the person who appears before you. The comet presents this moment beyond reason or reasonableness, escaping the will to characterize, to map one's identity into a larger scheme of social understanding. So one of the things that Du Bois is trying to struggle with, grapple with in this particular encounter is what I would call a utopian ethic. What does it mean to respond ethically, to create a community in a moment of crisis when there is so much history and weight and stress upon the relationships that emerge from society. And Du Bois glimpses a utopian ethics by suggesting that interracial intimacy, solidarity is possible in a brief moment. What it looks like is something much more fragile, something critical, skeptical of itself. What Du Bois tries to tell us is that community is a work in progress. Utopia requires a shared commitment and a sense of shared vulnerability. Communicating and acting are to be reimagined as problems to be worked through. So when Du Bois gives us this brief account of utopian solidarity. He imagines a vision of engagement that is fragile, tragic, vulnerable. And for Du Bois, these are categories not to be eschewed, not to be jettisoned, but to be embraced. Because one of the great dangers, Du Bois believes, is the notion of perfection. Perfection is common both in the idea of racial hierarchy and utopia. So when Du Bois tries to reframe and rethink utopia in a critical way, he's trying to retain that spirit of hope while at the same time infusing it with a sense of vulnerability. And for Du Bois, it's that vulnerability of skepticism, of continued engagement, of openness, the recognition of failure that needs to be maintained, that needs to be centered in any kind of future society, in any kind of liberatory practice. But of course, as would be expected, just as we think that a romantic resolution has occurred, white supremacy and racism interject. So at the conclusion of the book, just as Jim and Julia have begun to redefine their identities briefly, begun to engage in a kind of 
rescue effort to see other survivors, it becomes clear that Julia, the white woman, her family is still alive. And a crowd emerges from the shadows. And as it does, Julia's husband thinks that Jim is about to engage in sexual violence against Julia. And in many ways, this is Du Bois' attempt to work through, to mirror in fiction what is happening in practice. And that, of course, is the lynching era, which occurs from 1890, roughly, to 1968. But the 19 teens and 20s are a high point of this vicious activity. And so at that moment, it's clear that Fred, who's the husband, wants to inflict violence upon Jim. And it's only due to Julia's protestations that there is some kind of escape from this bloody reality, which many Black citizens are um, dealing with, suffering through. And so Du Bois concludes the comet on a sense of resignation, but also allows us to glimpse the possibilities of a future within it. And I think that there is something incredibly important and productive about this back and forth to see the future, to see possibility, but also to recognize that that possibility may be jeopardized by certain things that we may not be fully aware of, or we are too fully aware of, racism, sexism, unconscious bias, class inequality, so on. I'd like to draw another example here, and that is based on the work of Octavia Butler, the great science fiction writer. So for those of you who have read uh, Butler's work, specifically the Parable series, you'll know that in the early 1990s, Butler was trying to grapple with a reality that became, in many ways, quite dystopian for many citizens across the United States. And that, of course, was the reality of privatization, of economic inequality, of ending social programs. You'll recall that Bill Clinton ran on ending welfare as we knew it. And so what Butler is trying to do is explore the end game. What is the logic of having a society that is run according to an instrumentalization of human life, a privatization of everything in sight? What happens to a society like that? So whereas Du Bois is trying to offer us a sense of hope, Butler is trying to give us a kind of logical extension of where we are in the 1990s and consider what are the alternatives to this way of life, to what she sees as being a devastation that is too difficult to digest, grapple with. So in the parable series, we're introduced to a society, it's a post-apocalyptic Los Angeles where there isn't clean water, where a government is authoritarian, where there are private police forces roaming the streets, where there's no sense of security, where violence is rampant. What Butler is trying to do is ask what happens in that kind of society? What are the logical extensions of dystopian practice? How does it impact the possibility of democracy, the possibility of freedom? And what are the ways to counter it? So what Butler tries to do is offer us something different. And that is the philosophy of Earthseed. Earthseed, according to Butler, is a vision of adaptability, of change, of coping with, working through, and adapting to crises, trying to find ways to maintain a sense of flexibility, precisely because we're not sure what the future might bring. So 
through this philosophy of Earthseed, which becomes something of a kind of revolutionary underground movement led by the protagonist in the novel, Lauren Oya Oamina, who's a Black woman who is engaged in the work of community building and community rejuvenation, Earthseed becomes what Butler believes could be an alternative. And although she does not fully engage the dynamics of Earthseed, or at the very least, for a political theorist, there isn't enough clarity about what exactly Butler might mean by Earthseed beyond uh, a general notion of adaptability, of improvisation, of pragmatism. What is clear is that Butler believes that there could be a response, an effective response to crisis and disaster and uncertainty. And that need not come from those in power. It can come from those who are marginalized. And it can come in conditions of hopelessness. So if you read both books, the parable books, it seems quite unlikely that there would be any success, that there would be any potential for a democratic community to emerge in such a dystopian space. And yet Butler, like Du Bois, tries to give us a glimpse of what that might look like. And it's defined by, in many ways, a sense of democratic accountability. All of the figures who subscribe to the philosophy of Earthseed try to share their ideas, engage in a kind of back and forth, are skeptical of one another, are willing to call each other out when there seem to be certain deficiencies in their ways of thinking. And so Butler is giving us a framework for thinking through what it would mean to resist, to challenge structures of violence, fundamentalism, authoritarianism. And in her view, it is not only dependent upon an ethos of flexibility and adaptiveness, it also requires a certain level of creativity within a group. It requires a certain kind of democratic sensibility that allows for engagement. So I'd like to conclude because I'd like to hear what folks think and uh, answer any of your questions. But I'd like to conclude by summarizing the complexities of Black utopian thought, which in many ways are crystallized by the conclusion of the parable books. So at the conclusion of Butler's work, there is a mission to leave the, the United States, to leave the world, and to find and colonize space. One of the things that is so striking about this particular image is that it also goes back to the first work of Black utopian speculative fiction, which is Blake, where there's an imagining of escape, of fugitivity, of moving past what exists. And yet in that image, of escape of fugitivity, there seems to be the hope, the radical hope that white supremacy, racism, black freedom can be different. That black autonomy, that the black subject can engage in a liberatory practice. And in doing so, fundamentally transform the world for all citizens to inject a sense of dignity, freedom, human flourishing that have always been obscured and frustrated by forces of power. But at the same time, there is also this pessimistic note that perhaps the only way to begin anew, to start something fresh, is to leave the spaces with which we have been so familiar with, whether geographic, whether intellectual, and so on. And so 
it's that back and forth of fugitivity, escape, and reconstruction that Black utopian thought works with, works through, and in many ways offers us important lessons for how to act and think politically today. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, that was really amazing. Um, I think uh, I, you know, I have some questions of, of my own, but I want to open up the floor for questions in case people have questions from online or in the room. Are there any questions for Alex? We do have one online question from Janine Viau. Uh, what about laying over a class analysis on this section from Du Bois? Uh, why does it matter that she is rarely beautiful and richly gowned or even golden haired? Is this to accent racial hierarchy? Uh, what if she wasn't richly gowned? What does he mean by the better class further on this selection? Thank you for that question. You know, I think what's important about Black utopian thought is that in many ways, it is a reflection of the specific figures, the specific thinkers that push it forth. So if you take someone like Du Bois, as much as Du Bois is consistently preoccupied with the question of race and racism, and also gender. Early on, he's one of the first um, theorists at the beginning of the 20th century, at least not counting Black feminists like Anna Julia Cooper, Ida B. Wells, certainly male theorists who are deeply concerned with the question of gender. Du Bois is also deeply concerned with class. So around this time, Du Bois shifts from a thinker who is trying to imagine society or a utopian alternative to society simply from the perspective of race and gender and also beginning to think more about class. So it's around this time that Du Bois starts to be actively involved with the Socialist Party. He starts to think about the various revolutionary possibilities of class struggle and uh, liberation. And so I think in a text like The Comet, he is trying to think through what an intersectional analysis might look like in terms of examining the dynamics of power that exist in society, but also offering all, an alternative to it. And I think that in this moment, which is expanded even more broadly in a book like Dark Princess, where Du Bois really engages questions of class. For instance, one of the protagonists who is uh, a royal um, uh, Indian princess, uh, Princess Katulia, begins to work in factories in Virginia. And it is precisely through working in factories in Virginia that she starts to recognize the experience of gender, race, and class. So this is Du Bois beginning his attempts to think about a much more pronounced intersectional approach, including class, gender, race, to questions of power and liberation. So hopefully that, that answers the question. We have another online question from Tion Carson. So what does Black utopian thought look like today? Are there any recent examples or works? That's a really excellent question. You know, I think that in many ways, there's a utopian impulse in movements like Black Lives Matter or the movements for Black Lives. And we can talk, I mean, you know, Julian can more eloquently describe, you know, the various uh, configurations in culture, you know, in comics, in art. But in terms of thinking about the impulse in contemporary political movements, you know, you take a look at something like uh, the movement for Black Lives. 
And what you see is that there's a real willingness to ask difficult questions. You take a look at the call, the injunction for rethinking the system of mass incarceration, you know, broadly through the category of prison abolition or, you know, to a lesser extent, you know, defunding the police, whatever. What's interesting today is that young activists are willing to ask to raise the possibility of utopia as something to be considered. In many ways, it, it's reminiscent of the 1960s when you had young activists who were not only living out various ideas of democratic accountability and engagement, as with SNCC in the Mississippi Delta, you know, trying to embody a vision of participatory democracy. But you also see today the call for reparation, which again is an old call, but there seems to be a willingness, young people, activists, perhaps because of the dystopian possibilities embedded within society, whether it's climate change, whether it's police brutality, whether it's economic inequality, et cetera, you start to see a willingness to ask questions that shatter extant common sense. And I think that that's significant and worth kind of exploring more. Uh, I noticed that you used a couple of paintings by Aaron Douglas in your That's presentation. Right. And, um, you know, well, one, I know, I want to know why. Uh, and secondly, um, when it comes to his ideas about Africa and the inspiration from Africa and the idea of negritude, you know, with Elaine Locke around that same time. How does this play in with the things that you've talked about? And why did you use Douglas's work to do that? I'll try. I mean, you're, you're, you're the uh, art historian, you know, so it's, and you're the artist. So it's, um, now I will say that um, on some level, you know, Aaron Douglas, who was a, a crucial figure in the Harlem Renaissance, you know, and in many ways he was, he was involved um, with fire. Um, you know, so there's a real connection to um, Zora Neale Hurston. You know, I think for me, one of the fascinating things about a figure like Douglas and also someone like Jacob Lawrence is an attempt to visualize a sense of emancipation through categories of surrealism, migration, change. I mean, one of the things that I think is so um, gripping and inspiring about a figure like uh, Douglas is that he's able to use the visual realm in a way that gestures towards a sense of possibility, towards a future, but also recognizing the constraints. You know, so so the image that I use, which is also the cover for the book. I think is a powerful image that captures the dialectic of looking forward, of imagining a sense of possibility, but also knowing that history weighs heavy, that constraint is ever present. And this is one of the things that I think is so kind of remarkable about the Harlem Renaissance. And, you know, you mention uh, Locke and you talk about, you know, this idea of a kind of new image of blackness that's circulating in the 1920s. One of the things that is so potent and powerful is the ways in which all of these figures, Douglas, Hughes, um, uh, 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 Jesse Falset, all of these figures were trying to create an image of beauty, genius, uh, possibility, liberation within the content within the context of massive constraint and uncertainty. So when Douglas is imagining a kind of utopian vision, he's also reckoning with the fact of lynching, with the Great Depression, with war. And all of this, I think, is what makes these images so powerful because they crystallize 
the way that we can think in process, in action, even in moments of despair, in moments of radical uncertainty, and that creativity is possible even when hope is lost. And that's one of the things that I think is so inspiring about Douglas's work in particular is that visual representation of what hope might look like when hopelessness is all around us. Thank you. Um, one more question, then I want to give it back to uh, the, the people online. Uh, so, so what I keep hearing in, in um, the material that you discussed, and also yesterday, we talked a lot about this idea of fluidity. Uh, and you, you, what the, the text that you've given in your presentation, uh, from what I'm gathering, the, the, the idea of fluidity, vulnerability, uh, precariousness, that's a part of Black utopian thought. So the question is a two-part question. Number one, why do you think that's the case? Why do you think it's the Black populace that comes up with that kind of utopia? And the second part of the question is, have you seen that, that kind of utopia at work in things that you, um, political arenas that you've actually seen exist in, you know, I don't care how small the political yeah. arena is. Have you yeah. seen it? That's, that's, a that's a great question, Trent. That's such a fantastic, you know. So the to answer the first part of your question, I think it's central to Black cultural production to be skeptical of a kind of naive progress or a simplified notion of hope and community. I mean, in many ways, you know, the Black experience is characterized by a grappling with a sense of creating community within the confines of domination. So this is on some level to be expected given the story of Black cultural production in the United States, at least. To your second uh, question, I think you see this kind of ethos in, you know, uh, street protests. I, I think you see this in the various movements that we saw in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd. You saw that sense of, for instance, politicizing grief. This goes back to figures like um, Mamie Till, who showed the world what white supremacy did to her son, Emmett, and had an open casket burial. You know, traditions of Black grief, mourning, that in a sense is connected to that utopian impulse where there's the hope, the conviction that a fluid approach to domination, that vulnerability can both capture and highlight the tensions in a society, but at the same time offer a way to transcend them. You know, this, this notion of tragedy being productive. And so when I think about the young activists who are out and at the one hand grieving with, along with George Floyd, grieving against the forces of white supremacy, but at the same time speaking out refusing to be silent, continuing to put their bodies on the line like generations before them. You know, to me, that's a microcosm of what a black utopian practice, at least when it comes to the ingredients for resistance slash world building, what that might look like. Because you can easily take this and say, this is a model of resistance, but it's also a model of community because let's say, you know, white supremacy is magically uh, defeated. What does community look like then? What kind of community do you want? Do you want a community that is governed by a sense of self-certainty, governed by a sense of hierarchy? Or do you want something that is much more fluid, that is much more precarious, because then it places a burden on all citizens to nourish it? I think that's one of the things that is so central to Black utopian thought the practice of cultivation, nourishing, where there's a certain level of responsibility 
that Black utopian theorists place on citizens to actualize and kind of create the beloved community. And I think that that sense of responsibility in many ways is missing from other utopian projects because you know, Euro-modern notions of utopia, whether it's Robert Owen, whether it's Thomas More, whether it's Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Diderot, et cetera, there's a kind of um, preoccupation with the vision as opposed to the practice of sustaining that vision. And one of the remarkable things about Black utopian thought is it's much more concerned with the ways of sustaining, nourishing, cultivating, as well as all of the ways that that can be broken, eclipsed. And I think that that as a model for engagement, it's much better to look at Black utopian texts than Euro-modern texts because there's a careful consideration of the ways, the ordinary practices to maintain these visions. Thank you. I think we've got time for at least one more question from online. Yes, uh, we have a question from Robin Newsom. So can you reflect more about the dichotomy of escape versus engagement in the African-American liberation tradition more broadly and in Black utopian thought more specifically? Thank you, thank you. I think that the two in many ways go hand in hand. I mean, whether we look at, for instance, Frederick Douglass, my bondage and my freedom, at the same time as Douglas, who was giving an account of his struggle with Edward Covey, struggle which he believes could lead to the death, Douglas is giving us a theory of what it means to resist and escape at the same time as he offers a theory of freedom based in fugitivity. So one of the things that I try to emphasize is that you know, there's a standard notion of freedom that assumes a, a level of stasis, of stability, where you have rights, they're maintained, you have freedom, it's maintained. Whether it's Douglas, whether it's Ida Wells, who is on the run as her office in Memphis is being firebombed, whether it's Martin Luther King, who is, as we know, always dealing with the threat of violence and white supremacy and ultimately um, is assassinated, there's this sense in both Black political thought, but also in Black utopian thought that links fugitivity with a sense of freedom. So escape is not simply an escape from the conditions of white supremacy, injustice, inequality. It's also a fugitivity within the concept of freedom itself. So freedom needs to be seen as a kind of fugitive um, experience. I think of, you know, speaking of art, I think of Jacob Lawrence and the classic series of uh, The Great Migration, where on the one hand, Lawrence pays homage to the citizens who are escaping racial violence while he's giving a vision of freedom in flight. What does that mean practically? What does it mean in terms of public policy? It means that things are never finished. It means that the struggle for freedom is always unfinished. And I think this theme of unfinished freedom is crucial as a way to rethink our dominant conceptions of freedom. And that's why I think both the Black tradition and Black utopian thought in particular give us a kind of melded, a fused notion of freedom and fugitivity that's quite valuable. Thank you. I think uh, we're right at the, the stopping time. Uh, this is wonderful, uh, Alex. Thank you once again. We really do appreciate it. Uh, you giving us a lot to think about and uh, I certainly will be getting your book. <laughs> Thank you, Trent. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. if anyone has any um, outstanding questions and would like to be in touch, um, feel free to send me an email. Okay, I will. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think that we uh, we we have a, a break now uh, from what ten to ten thirty. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll let you go until then. <laughs>